Well, last month we began a lively discussion about the future of network news. At that time, the talk revolved around the Brian Williams affair at NBC. But tonight, we zero in on an area we just glanced over back then, the impact of online viewing habits on decisions about what is news. It raises a lot of questions. In Edmonton tonight, Margot Goodhand, the editor of the Edmonton Journal, and in Regina, senior editor at the New Republic. Jeet here. Congratulations, Jeet, on that. Thank here you. Here in Toronto, Carleton University Associate Professor of Journalism, Chris Waddell, alongside Marissa Nelson, Senior Director of Digital Media at CBC News. Their thoughts in a moment, but first, click on this. Clicks. They've become a master research tool. This simple action determines a lot more than you might think. Advertisers want to know how often you do it on their products. Political parties want to know which of their competitors you're clicking on, especially if you're not clicking on them. And then there are people like us, news organizations. We are glued to daily click results. What are you reading? What are you watching? What are you sharing? Those are just some of the questions being asked. The answers all end up in most viewed lists. That's smart business for online news organizations, but what about their print and broadcast partners? Should they be equally fascinated by those numbers? Let's talk about how to brush your teeth in space. And when some of the most popular online media sites attract hundreds of millions of clicks on viral videos. Well, I'm a watch 2015 here on Fox News Channel. Should that make them a slam dunk for network news? YouTube remains the Everest of online videos. Ah! <laughs> In this country alone, its stats claim 2.9 billion monthly clicks for YouTube videos. That's a heck of a lot of clicks. No surprise then that some of them end up judged news. Young people are driving this, and that shows up in TV viewing numbers. Ten years ago, 49% of young people said they watch TV to get their news. By 2012, that figure had dropped to 34%, and it's still dropping. Is this the way to counter that? Putting clickbait on air, trying to reel in those all-important younger viewers. To be sure, there are lots of serious online media sites. Their values are not the issue. Instead, are traditional news organizations lowering the bar of what's news in a chase for what makes people click? And is anything wrong with that? Oh boy, this should be fun. Time for some answers. All right, well, let's start with some basics. And uh, Marissa, why don't you start us? Does, does something that's gone viral have inherent news value? I don't think it has an inherent news value. I think what happens is when it, it goes past a specific bar, when there is mass consumption of that viral thing, then it becomes news. The other element of viral news, which I think pushes something that's just, you know, a funny cat video into news, is shared experience. We had this fantastic example out of uh, PEI, which has had a crazy amount of snow, where a guy dug a tunnel to, to his car, and it got 2.4 million views on Facebook for instance but really for me that was news not because it got 2.4 million views on Facebook but because there was this shared experience Canadians many Canadians had a terrible winter and PEI was among the hardest hit so really that becomes becomes news because it's that shared experience Chris where are you on this I'm um, a little bit differently I think I, I think I think if I look step back a bit Peter and look at a couple of things two things are really important Nobody gets their news from a single medium anymore. Everyone's looking all over the place to find, and find their news. So someone who's reading something in print may be watching TV, online, and also on smartphones. The second thing is no one gets their news from a single source anymore. You look to lots of different sources, and you tend to look for different sources for different things. So I think the thing that traditional news organizations need to be worried about is they need to specialize and focus on things that, that are important and that they think are important and that they think they can be the best at to get that audience. And that may include viral things on occasion, but a lot of times it may not. Margot, where are you on, uh, on viral videos and whether they're inherently news? I think it, I, I agree with Marissa on the fact that if it gets to be so huge that everybody's talking about it, then it, it has a news value to it because it's rare and unusual and everybody's talking about but it. But it is so huge, is that, is that based it's, on numbers then? Are we yeah, uh, counting it's, it's, clicks there? 
totally based on numbers. You can see it kind of cut it coming across Twitter, then reaching Facebook, then everybody's talking about it, and everybody in your feed is talking about it. But the difference between us, as Chris said, the difference between a, a news, well, a, a news traditional newsroom now is that we are looking at that kind of clickbait digitally. We love that stuff digitally. I think it's fun. But when it comes to the newspaper, we cannot. We we cannot put that stuff in there, particularly just because it's so quick. It, it rises and it falls, and by the time we come to press, it's old news. And we just don't, we don't play those games. We play them digitally, yes, but uh, the paper has to have context and all that other jazz, and you cannot, you can't even pretend to be trendy and, uh, and do that kind of stuff because those things are, are so 10 hours ago. <laughs> That's an interesting way of looking at it. Jeet? Well, I think anything can be news if you can tell a story about it. Because news is story making. Uh, you know, you had these great old columnists uh, like Murray Kempton who could interview a homeless person and make news out of it. So, like, viral videos are. Uh, part of the human experience. We can't pretend this is something that's like alien to us. This is the way uh, you, uh, almost everybody communicates these days. So I if you can make a coherent, interesting story that reveals something out of a viral video, why not? Well, let's scratch a little deeper on that because it, it makes you wonder whether we've actually changed what we consider news as a result of what we're seeing online. Chris? I think in part, yes, Peter, but I think part that's driven by, uh, by trying to get advertising, adverti people to watch, and, uh, and if you get people to watch, then advertisers will advertise. I think there's a big issue the media is facing at the moment about advertising, which is a problem, and that's where media's got lots of its revenue. So the temptation is to do things that attract audience as opposed to things that may, uh, that may actually be, you could describe it as more serious, I suppose. So it is changing. What yes, I think so. Is. I think so, and I think that's being driven in part by concern by news organizations that they're losing audience to some new media, and how do they try to retain audience? But that may not be the best strategy. Marissa? Well, I, I, I guess another way of putting it is, is the internet sort of dumbing down news? And I would say categorically not. I mean, there are plenty of news organizations that treat the internet as this fun little cat video thing over in that corner. And yes, I suppose in that case, it's, it's diminishing the quality of their news. But we know in real time what our audiences are responding to. So if we're not changing how we judge news based on that real data, then we're just sort of putting our heads in the sand. I hope we're going to continue to evolve what our news values are. And the internet is an incredible way of judging um, what people care about and what they don't. Often stories percolate on social before they come to traditional media. Um, and it has a strong, you know, a strong role in making sure we know that maybe a community cares about a particular story that we've ignored. Well, here's the other argument on whether or not it's dumbing down the news and it's this whole question of the zero-sum game that the, the news plays that if you run one of these you know hot stories of the day remember the, a couple of weeks ago the black and gold dress or whatever the colors were we, we all saw them white, differently white and gold, white but and gold. white and gold black and gold <laughs> yellow and blue black and whatever blue. Um, but you know once you play that story are you squeezing out something that's more traditionally called news value Jeet? Well, I think that there's always been a balance, right? Like, you can take, a, you know, the, the uh, Edmonton Journal is a serious paper, the Montreal Gazette is a serious paper, but they also carry comics, they carry horoscopes, they carry, you know, advice columns, they carry recipes. News is always a balance. I, I like to think of news as a money laundering operation, you know? Just like the mafia <laughs> will run a nice restaurant and also deal with drugs, news involves having some brain candy as well as more serious things. And, um, I mean, the black and blue dress that came from BuzzFeed which does a lot of you know uh, cat video stuff but they also do like really great reporting my friend Adam Sewer uh, works for BuzzFeed and he's done like incredible reporting on Ferguson and on police violence in America are we squeezing out news to to get these other stories or, or is Jeet saying what's quite correct that there's you know lots of room in the Edmonton Journal for everything uh Absolutely. There's lots of room. We, we create packages every day. I'll use Jeet's analogy and take it even further. We, you have to have a little dessert with your main course, mm -hmm. and we are very aware every day of the packages we're creating. So just as you might have a lot of political stories one day, you might say, well, we need to have something that people will 
find some interest in or we need to have something different and we're always looking for something maybe to leaven the package but I also I remember the olden days doing this stuff at the Medicine Hat News and on a Sunday when there was no news we used to throw in pseudo news and it was pretend news it, it didn't matter to our readers and it wasn't relevant but it was stuff that we it was what we had so I think sometimes that these social media things are, are, are almost more relevant or more interesting because more people are kind of tuned into it than that stuff that we used to use to pad the paper. So right. I think that it's different. I, I get it for papers. What about for television network news that are they're limited to a specific amount of time, right down to the second? Yeah, right? I, think, I think what we're really talking about, Peter, is not so much papers but online as well as television news. Mm -hmm. And I would take a different point of view in part. And I think news organizations need to think a lot more about where else people can see things these days. Mm -hmm. So you don't all have to do the same dress or the same cat video, or you need to think more about the fact that your audience, if they're interested in that, is likely going to see it somewhere else. And the question becomes, do you really think it's important for your audience, for your audience, which means each news organization's got to think more about what their audience is interested in. And, That's and, exactly right. And I think That's the result, exactly and I think what we right. see yeah. at the moment is a lot of everybody chasing the same sort of thing, and then it does, then it does knock out other things that you could be doing that your audience might be more interested in. Okay. Well, I disagree. I think we're always well aware of our brand, and our brand is what it is, and we know what our readers are, you know, what they're engaged in. So, no, I think we are we're very well aware that we don't want to erode the brand. So lots of times our packages are fairly well, and even online, we Marissa? have a... And, and I think it's just simplistic to say, well, if you're just chasing what BuzzFeed and Huffington Post are chasing, you're just you're, you're diluting your brand. Really, there are many levers in the digital world that you can pull in order to get audiences in. Breaking news brings a whole bunch of audience who never come to us in a regular way, but we have a small window of opportunity if they have a great experience with us and find the information that they need to come back and, be, and make us a habit. So really, I think there's, you know, the BuzzFeed sort of stories bring in one kind of audience, which are an important, uh, an important audience, and then we can convert those people into regular, habitual users of our content. All right, I'm going to take a break here in a minute, but G, help me with this one. You know, how has, has the pressures of online and what you can see online changed the way you do your job on a daily basis? Well, the main thing is just speed because uh, news like happens, and of course, you know, reporters are always under deadline. But uh, right now, there's this idea of the hot take, like you know, like uh, Hillary announces and she buys a burrito, and what's the? You have to have, have an interesting angle on that. You have to have a hot take, and uh, there's a, a large burnout factor. There's been some really good articles done uh, recently about like you know how quickly journal young journalists are burning out, and so I think that's the real problem more than the news being delivered that the speed of the creation of these stories uh, can just like uh, drive people nuts. Well, before that happens to us, we're going to take this <laughs> quick break. But when we come back, we'll have this question. Will there be a day when the water skiing squirrel video leads the national? Or has that already happened? <laughs> And welcome back to the Media Watch. Margot Goodhand is in Edmonton, Jeet here is in Regina, and Chris Waddell and Marissa Nelson are right here in Toronto. Full disclosure, the water skiing squirrel thing is kind of, you know, kind of a joke within the news business. It actually did happen, but it was years ago. It's not even in the, you know, funny viral videos of today. The water skiing squirrel was like in the 1970s. I remember it. We all argued about running it at that time, too. Let me wrap up with this quick round the, the horn on this. And it's really what we think the role of traditional media is in the landscape that exists today. Margot, why don't you start us? Well, I think when you look at the whole digital landscape and see how fragmented it is and how varied it is, I think the traditional media's job still is to curate and filter and try to put some kind of context on that barrage or within that barrage. And the second thing is to really respect our readers because I think they're smart. They're already watching and reading us because they, they know that we're going to give them what they're looking for. So it's very important. I think that, that, that respect the readers and curate and filter and, co and create content. So. Chief? 
the role of all media, whether it's traditional or new media, is to tell human, humanly meaningful stories, stories that like touch readers. And since we live in a world where like social media is a big part of everyday life, that has to be incorporated into the news. That, that just seems like common sense to me. Chris? I think traditional media have a role, Peter, that relies on their tradition for for being accurate, for verifying, for trying to get to the source of things, and, and, and that have for a long time led people to think that if it's in a traditional media outlet, it's probably true. So I think that's continued important role for them, uh, but I think probably in a more specialized way and looking at things that they think they can really, uh, they can play a role on and they can be distinct, distinctive on, they can find their own stories and do some of that. And you're really looking then at, 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 at the traditional news organizations focusing down. Yes. Uh, because because five people, I don't think traditional news organizations can continue to be everything for everyone. They don't have the resources and they don't have the audience because the audience is all over the place. So traditional news organizations need to figure out what they think are important and focus on that and make sure their audience understands they're great at that because then they'll come to them. Marissa. Yeah, I think point of view, context, and depth are things that traditional media, any any um, product that comes out once or twice a day, needs to go to the context, the depth. And I don't think the uh, you know internet and the short attention span that we always believe everybody has has been eroded for that kind of content at all. In fact, we see huge interest in long form journalism in digital as well. So people trust brands, trust those traditional brands, and and want to have them tell them the context and the meaning behind the news. All right. Fascinating discussion. I think we probably could do this every month because <laughs> things keep changing. So do the way we tell the news. But at the end of the day, as Jeet says, it's all about storytelling. Thank you all. Margo in Edmonton, Jeet in Regina, and Marissa and Chris here in Toronto. And thank you as well. Don't be shy. We know you have thoughts about all this. cbcnews.ca slash the national is where to send them.